Welcome to the panel, everyone. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mara Eakin from the AV Club. And with me here, we got Luke Matheny and Kay Wilson Stalling. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, Hi. <laughs> hello. Um, tell us, for those who don't know, who you guys are and your relationship to the show Ghostwriter. Kay, maybe you want to start. Sure. So I'm Kay Wilson Stallings. I head up creative and production at Sesame Workshop. And, um, and, and, and so I developed the show. We, we, I was part of the team that reimagined Ghostwriter. Luke, what about and, you? Uh, I'm Luke Matheny. I am an executive producer on the show, as well as the lead director. I directed the episode that you, the piece of the episode you just saw, and uh, I directed many episodes of the series, and kind of directed the other directors, so to speak, and uh, was sort of the head of the show up in Toronto, where we uh, where we shot uh, shot the series. Um, Kay, what was your relationship with the original series, I'm losing my shoulder, um, mm -hmm. and then why did you decide now was the time to bring back Sesame Workshop decided, hey, you know what, let's revisit Ghost Rider. Okay, so I, I was too old <laughs> to watch the original series, <laughs> but I remember it, and, um, and so, you know, about five years ago at the workshop, uh, we decided that we wanted to be um, much more of a, of, of a team of makers. And so for previously, Sesame Street was really the, the main show that the workshop had created. And about five years ago, we decided that we wanted to um, create more content, not just for preschoolers, but for older kids as well. So in addition to uh, new and original content, we decided to look back at some of the productions that the workshop had pre produced previously and see if there was anything that felt like the time had come to reimagine it in a different way. And, um, and when we talked about Ghostwriter, there was an immediate affinity, especially with folks that had been at the workshop that were there when the, when the original was um, in production or folks who remember watching it as kids themselves. And to speak to how strong and how relatable the original was, we literally went out to about five different uh, creators and we gave them the assignment of reimagine Ghostwriter. And each of those, each of the creative that we got back was as strong as the next. Like it was really hard to make a decision on what direction to go in because people just really related so much to uh, the idea of reimagining Ghost Rider. So we feel like we made the right decision. We're so happy with the show. And, um, and it's just, we've gotten such a great response. And, um, and it was really, it, it's been great to see how people have responded to the show, not only kids, but also their parents who remember the show as kids themselves. Yeah, was that part of the decision thinking, I mean, I have to imagine, I know a lot of shows, um, there's a fun element now to these parents who originally watched the shows coming mm -hmm. back to it with their kids. Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. that something you guys considered. Yeah, it was definitely something we considered because also one of the things that we're doing as a workshop is, you know, our the content that we had made previously was really targeting preschoolers but now we're targeting preschoolers and older kids and families and so when we look at the content that we make we look at content that's going to reach kids but that's also going to bring in families as well and so again as we were talking about ghostwriter internally and hearing about uh you know it's always been one of those shows that every once in a while someone will write an article about it and it sparks a lot of conversation and so you really can get a sense of how much still that show had such an impact on um, on kids who are now adults and have children in that target age group. Luke, what was your relationship with the show? And um, when you heard, hey, Ghostwriter, where did your brain go? I did not know what it was. I am also a little <laughs> too old uh, to have caught it the first time around. Uh, I think I was maybe in like late high school, early college when it was on. Um, so I aged out of it. My um, my wife is uh, seven years younger, though, so a lot of her friends uh, and her, like, they all knew the show very well, and they um, uh, they were incredibly excited that I was a part of it. And since joining the project, uh, every meeting I go on where I talk about having worked on this show, um, yeah, I mean, there's a certain kind of 30-something exec that is, like, uh, <laughs> very excited when I say that I worked on Ghost Rider because people have such fond memories of, um, of having watched it. Um, uh, when they were younger. Uh, I was also probably arguably a little too old for it, but that didn't mean that I didn't watch didn't it. Didn't stop you? <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a younger brother, so I'll have that. I have oh, there thoughts. you go. <laughs> that was your You've cover. Yeah. 
So you mentioned, you know, that Sesame Workshop has predominantly done stuff for preschool age children. Mm -hmm. Ghostwriter Mm -hmm. is for a little bit older Mm -hmm. of an age range. Um, What makes things appealing to like six to 11 year olds? And how do you guys sort of support that educational background, background for the stories? Okay. So, you know, we research everything. And, and we research it with kids. So regardless of who the target audience is, whether they're preschoolers or whether they're bridge like four to seven or whether they're older, like the audience for Ghostwriter six to 11, we take out, um, we go right to kids and share with them the content, share with them the story ideas, get their feedback that helps to inform the creative. And, um, and so when we think about shows with any kind of educational component, all of the shows that we make at the workshop are mission driven, which they're designed to help make sure that kids are smarter, stronger, and kinder. And that's in everything that we make. And, um, and so research, hearing from parents, hearing from kids, and knowing that we're really working with our in-house curriculum team and sometimes external experts, uh, like subject matter experts, to make sure that the curriculum is embedded in everything that we make and that we achieve our goals, which ultimately are to make sure that we make content that's impactful for our audience. How did you guys choose the characters for for Ghostwriter? Like, how did you cast the, I mean, how did you both write the particular group of kids and then cast those kids? Well, it's a a combination of, uh, you know, Andrew Ornstein, who is the showrunner of the show and his, and the amazing writer's room. You know, we come up with sort of an entertaining, as, as far as we can tell, an entertaining mix of characters that we can come up with. So, you know, these four kids are going to be the ones that we experience the whole story through. And it's interesting it, on the page, it, it starts maybe a little broader, like the Siobhan character was maybe as originally envisioned more of a conventional nerdy know-it-all type mm-hmm. or uh, Curtis was more of like a bro jock kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, you have to get actual human beings to play these parts and uh, their kids who bring their own experiences, their own kind of qualities to them. So that's always a fun part of the um, process for me. So then we hire Amadi. Uh, she's the actress who played um, Siobhan. She's a, a much kind of cooler sort of vibe mm-hmm. about her. So the, the character sort of evolved where she was both sort of cool and smart, which I think is a nice, uh, it's an appealing combination. I think we've sort of seen enough of sort of the nerd stereotypes. So like, uh, like th- that kind of brought into that way. Um, same thing uh, with uh, Justin who played Curtis. Um, he's just like a, a more sensitive guy than, than I think that the character was sort of written as. So you, you got a lot more feeling and passion in his, his performance. So it's always a little bit of, The idea that we have when we are, it's a bunch of adults sitting around a conference table coming up with characters that we think will work for a mystery. And then kind of when I come in as the director, then I have to meld those ideas with the reality of the kids we're casting. And then we kind of ideally create like a, something better than what we originally envisioned. (laughs) I have to imagine too, you're trying to also sort of build this like diversity of experiences, like both on the page and on screen, like, Oh, this these kids have a recent have gone through a recent divorce and are living with their dad part of the time and and this guy just moved from another town and you know you're kind of building in a little bit of backstory so hopefully kids will see something that they recognize on screen in their own life. Yeah, I mean I think I think it's uh, probably t- dual purpose to exactly what you just said where there's a, a a way in for kids to kind of relate to the uh, to the story and then for us as the writers it's if each one comes in with sort of a pre-existing conflict and backstory that just kind of fuels some stories for the rest of the season so we can kind of build build the stories on top of that um a big component of the show is that these classic tv characters that we know and love or not not tv characters literary characters that we know and mm-hmm. love have been released from the books and the kids have to read the books to f- you know to figure out how to get them back you don't need to right. and also they're the only ones that can see them um mm-hmm. Talk about reading, maybe this is a K question, as a message point here. Like, mm-hmm. I have to imagine a lot of kids, maybe you're not necessarily picking up as many books as they were when we were growing up. Um, why is reading such a valuable, like, was that an education point that you guys really wanted to focus on? Like, was that mm-hmm. one of brought Ghostwriter back? And how is reading integrated into sort of the curriculum of Ghostwriter? Mm-hmm. So when uh, Ghostwriter first launched, the, the first... Um, you know, version of Ghostwriter, the curriculum focus was actually teaching kids how to read. 
And, um, and that was a big, um, important um, mandate in schools. And it was something that the workshop felt really strongly about in wanting to support that. And as we talked to curriculum experts, we talked to you know, teachers and, and, and administrators and parents as well, we find out that a lot of times with kids in this target audience, who's like, again, six to nine, they're at that point, especially on the six and seven uh, year old group, they're, they've, they've already learned to read. So they're no longer learning to read, now they're reading to learn. And what happens is a lot of times kids, as they are in that kind of, you know, stage of, of, of their reading uh, development is that they try to, they tend to gravitate to the same types of books over and over and over again. They'll read, you know, graphic novels or they'll read only fiction or they'll read only nonfiction. And what we wanted to do in introducing a show that has a literature component is give kids an opportunity to expand the type of books that, um, they're, that they can experience. And, and with the idea that um, we do classic public domain books. So they might be books that kids may have read picture book versions of when they were younger or were read to, or they might be familiar with a movie version. But now this is an opportunity to get kids to dive into those books themselves and uh, read these classic books like Alice's Adventure in Wonderland and Jungle Book. And, um, and then likewise, we wanted to also give kids an opportunity to experience books that maybe they've never read before. And so we have a poem and we have a um, one story that one, one of the books that we use as one of the arcs, that's an original story that kids, you know, will be reading and experiencing for the first time. So having an opportunity to create content that really encourages kids to watch the show and then want to go and read the book in which the characters have, you know, they've just seen in the show is so empowering. And just, you know, anecdotally and from focus group testing that we've done, we see that that's, it's working. Kids are really excited about jumping into the book and experiencing it in a whole new way after they've watched the episode themselves. Well, we can actually throw to a clip here because I think there's a beautifully designed scene of a tea party from the Alice in mm -hmm. Wonderland second episode that I would love to watch. Let's do that. It's six o'clock. Day time. Oh, it's six o'clock. I really must find the queen. It's not six. It's actually 3.30. See? Nothing but time. Your hair. Once cutting. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with you? Oh, I am mad, of course. <laughs> but don't worry, we're all mad here. I'm definitely getting mad. So, uh, what's the occasion? Well, we are celebrating, finally, being out of the Queen's grasp. I do not know where this is, but I do know it is where the Queen is not. For the record, I am not celebrating, merely biding my time till the Queen returns. See, she rules all of Wonderland. This isn't Wonderland. It's middle school. Oh no, I need to get to Wonderland post haste. All right. Um, Luke, maybe you can sort of speak to how this was put together, the actual day of the, the show, and like why this was such a climactic scene and set of characters. Uh, sure. So this was uh, an exciting and nerve-wracking scene <laughs> to uh, to direct. Um, just sort of a, a base of difficulty is when you have any scene with a bunch of people sitting around a table, that's just a lot more shots you have to get to make the whole scene work. Uh, plus, it's since it's also kids acting, uh, because of child labor laws, you know, you, you're sort of restricted the amount of time you can shoot. So we had to get all these things happening. And if uh, the Mad Hatter crushed everything on the table, we didn't have that much time to reset everything and do it again. So we had to really kind of re rehearse it. Um, the thing I was excited about uh, was the, in the script, it was originally gonna be written to be in the school library. And uh, as different kind of realities and locations came up, we sort of saw this auditorium uh, that was really cool. And we thought of restaging it there, which I think ended up giving a nice kind of theatrical sort of flourish to the whole um, event. And, um, you know, it really just gives you enough room to uh, have this guy jump up and down on, on all the, uh, the, the plates and the different things that, uh, that were compiled. And there, something we were trying to do, which maybe is more evident the second time you look at it, is all of the little pieces of uh, food and <laughs> designs on the table themselves are 
things that were hypothetically stolen from different parts of the school. So you see like a kid's calculator or like a big pencil or a, a you know, paper clip holder or staplers or things like that, uh, along with all the foods that were sold from the bake sale. So it was, it was a fun challenge to uh, try to meld sort of the popular imagination of the Alice uh, Adventures in Wonderland Tea Party with kind of the resources we had at the school. And, uh, and the, the actor, uh, Josh Credis, who played uh, the Mad Hatter was just, um, you know, endlessly inventive and entertaining and a joy to be around. It's always good when you have these kind of guest actors who are adults come in who also have like a wonderful rapport with the children. And that, that definitely was the case, uh, was the case here. Uh, and what about the rabbit? Was he hard to work with? <laughs> the rabbit, uh, this was very early on in the production process and it does take a while for uh, kids to get used to acting to like a stick. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is then going to be turned into a CGI rabbit later. Um, they, they got better as they went along. In, in later on, it's Jungle Book. They had to, there's a panther they had to tr try to react to. So sometimes it's sort of <laughs> hard to get kids to say, like, no, this is the craziest thing you've ever seen. And you're pointing at a physical like, piece of PVC pipe when, in <laughs> fact, it's going to be animated into this sort of incredible uh, CGI animation voiced by Neil Patrick Harris. So uh, actually, that, that always helped when you told them it was going to be Neil Patrick Harris talking, <laughs> and they would sort of take it a little more seriously. Yeah, I have to imagine if you told me it was going to be the craziest thing I'd ever seen, then I would almost overact it too. Do you know what I mean? Like, you <laughs> right. realistic to some to some reaction level. Um, uh, what was the difference? I mean, this is a streaming series. It is broken up into like little chunks, but what do you think is the difference of producing something that's like one episode one week versus a streaming series? And maybe Kay, you can speak to this too, because mm -hmm. I have to imagine that the way people watch something like Sesame Street now is very different than the way they might've watched it years ago. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. watching different chunks, they're watching, they're watching it all at one time, they're watching two mm -hmm. hours of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so it's like when you think about like a streaming service versus linear, you know, we do see, you know, data that suggests that kids are spending more time watching content on streaming services than on linear. It's not a significant amount. And, um, and I know that obviously with all kids being home now, I'm sure that numbers for both streaming and linear have gone up significantly. And um, so, you know, what we find is like with little kids, they'll tend to watch the same episode over and over and over again, because for them, they're, they're mastering the information and what they're learning. And so uh, when you have a show like Sesame Street, um, even if you might have multiple episodes, if you go to a, you know, a, a streaming service where multiple episodes are available, we still hear parents and anybody that has a pre preschooler probably can attest to this, is that their child will still watch the same episode repeatedly. And, um, and then after maybe 20 times, then they'll go and watch another episode and they'll watch that another 20 times. But for older kids, it's not the same thing because they, there's not that cognitive overload that you have with preschoolers. So they can watch it once, they've got it, now they're ready to move on to the next. And the great thing about uh, the way that, you know, Ghost Rider was, was written and produced is that every episode, even though it's a, it's a, it's a, a standalone art that goes through the whole 26 episode arc, but every episode ends on like a cliffhanger. So you want to go and watch the next and watch the next. So, you know, we don't have um, my, my, my assumption. And again, this is anecdotally and it's from what we've heard from kids and families is that kids are watching the first episode, then they're watching the next episode and then they're watching the next episode. Um, so that that kind of structure works really well for this kind of a show on a streaming platform. You're making it tough for parents to say no, turn it off. <laughs> right. <laughs> Five more minutes. <laughs> um, the first Ghost Rider was very famously like shot in Brooklyn, Barry, New York, whatever. This doesn't seem this this, this Ghost Rider is not that Ghost Rider. Um, why did you guys decide to shoot in Ontario? I think that's where it shot, correct? And like, why did you decide to uh, you know mix it up a little? Well, the uh, the production company Sinking Ship was uh, is based in Toronto, so that was just going to be one of the realities of the production that we were going to mm -hmm. shoot in Toronto. And then just having sort of seen the, um, you know, re read the first couple scripts and hearing about where Andrew was t planning to take the story and then just knowing a little about the architecture in Toronto, I, I tried to fashion the pilot as more of like, uh, 
a universal post-industrial city kind of with like lots of brick, lots of texture, lots of cold, uh, cold wintry kind of atmosphere with kids in coats and um, maybe like a modern day Charles Dickensy sort of <laughs> thing where, where, where there's lots of mystery and lots of colorful characters that we're going to encounter in this sort of mysterious city. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, it was sort of born out of the reality of shooting in Toronto. It seemed uh, maybe an odd choice to have the whole thing set in Toronto. That seemed a little uh, strange. Uh, and certainly, you know, there was a lot of great things about, you know, really strongly grounding that first one in Brooklyn. But uh, yeah, I guess we, we thought maybe there was a way to sort of open up the story and universalize it a little more by, by having the city be somewhat anonymous and being coy with what it was. Yeah, and also kind of opens it, it seems like a very, um, just on the screen, it seems like a very safe city, you know, they're walking back and forth to school, they're dropping into the bookstore, like they're going, you know what I mean? Like, it just seems like a city, but still doable, like mm -hmm. a city that you don't feel bad about kids being in. <laughs> uh, totally, and that, that was very much um, part of uh, Andrew Ornstein, the, um, the showrunner's kind of vision, because he actually is a Toronto native, as, as it happens, even though he lives in um, uh, Los Angeles, but he, he would always sort of describe how he wanted like a bigger city where people look out for each other and people know each other, you know, at the corner store or at the bookstore. And I thought, oh, that's a nice fiction. Uh, life isn't really like that. And then I went to went to Toronto and met all these people. And I'm like, oh, it actually is very, very nice. People, <laughs> do, people really do look out for each other in uh, an incredible way. Um, speaking of looking out for each other, you guys were awarded a 2020 Parents' Choice Gold Award. And part of what they said about the show was that it highlights friendship, problem solving, reading, and family respect. We touched on those other three, but family, can you talk about the family respect piece there? Like, how is that built into the curriculum of the show and the scripts? And like, why is that an important message to, to teach kids of this, to teach kids in general? Well, from a, you know, curriculum standpoint, it's really, we want to make sure that the characters and the experiences that they have and the relationships that they have are relatable. So that's not only curricular focus, but it's also more about wanting to create content that kids can relate to. And so, you know, kids have siblings and kids have, you know, parents that may be divorced or they, and they live in one home and they have to go back and forth or kids have grandparents that they live with. And so, you know, for everything that we make, we want to make sure that the kids, the audience can really relate to the character. So it's like, this is the world that kids are living in. And these are the kinds of experiences and relationships that they're having with different types of families. So showing different kinds of families is something that's really, really important to us. Um, also in the, the congratulations vein, you guys are nominated for eight Emmys, which is tied to Sesame Street. Sesame Workshop is up for 30. So, Kay, you're just like firing on all <laughs> cylinders there. <laughs> that's um, true. You got writing, you got directing, you got costumes for Ghost Rider. Um, what, I mean, this is, this is the first half of the first season of that show, of this show. Like, what kind of early, rec like, this is a pretty early recognition for the show. Some years, some shows, it takes years for them to get going, get recognized. What does that mean to you guys each individually? You know, for the workshop, what it, it's so exciting about is that, you know, Sesame Street's been around for 50-something years. And, you know, the number of accolades and awards that that series has won over the course of a half of a century is, is you know, it's in the hundreds. And, um, and so for the workshop to, as I spoke about earlier, now we're into this, you know, new phase in our, in our, you know, kind of, um, lifespan where we're creating original content. And, um, and so for the workshop to be recognized for content beyond Sesame, it was really exciting because it's like every time the Emmys come out, we know that Sesame is going to get nominated. Um, but to have something like Ghost Rider that really was only, it's a couple of months on the air before, you know, the nominations came out was really um, rewarding. And it was a testament to, you know, the, the, the reaction and how well the show has was is produced and and how um great the content is so it's, it's exciting luke what about you what about you luke <laughs> um i think for me it's made my wife less resentful for me <laughs> going to toronto for a long time away from our then two-year-old uh so that takes some of the sting out um but uh you know let's face it these these shows it's a tiny bullseye with this show because it's like kids, lots of visual effects, 
uh, unforgiving Toronto winter, <laughs> a very complicated story. So like, like there are a lot of things that make this like more and more difficult. So, and require more and more work. So it's nice when you have to work like so hard on something that one, the most important, like it turns out in a way that you're proud of, which really is the most important. Mm -hmm. And then just to have this kind of external recognition does, does just sort of sweeten the deal and make you feel like <laughs> all that work like was recognized, you know? Um, so Serious Fest celebrates emerging mm -hmm. underserved voices in the industry. What advice can you guys offer writers looking to create kids content specifically? And what advice can you, uh, can you offer producers and decision makers about sort of like fostering new talent behind the scenes? Uh, well, you know, from this workshop's perspective, you know, we are always, always looking to partner and develop, to identify and develop new talent, whether it's directing talent, whether it's writing talent, the whole, you know, the gamut, because obviously it's, um, it's important. It, it, we want to have voices and we want to have different experiences represented because that's the best kind of content that you're going to get. And, um, you know, telling the same story over and over again, doesn't really service anyone. And, um, and so you know, when I went to that question, it's like, why wouldn't you want to, you know, get the best talent and, and, and really have an opportunity to have voices and experiences and um, it just makes for a more dynamic production in general. So for writers who have a desire to work in kids TV um, and maybe they come from, like you said, underrepresented areas, um, I would just recommend that they, you know, try to get you know, a mentor, try to reach out to somebody who's making content who you could tell definitely has this as their um, priority, that they're looking to make sure that they're relying on uh, talent and writing talent that's from a lot of different uh, backgrounds. And, um, you know, uh, and, and try to get those kind of relationships established. And I think that more and more, especially you know, these days, I'm hoping that we're going to see a trend where, you know, people aren't just talking about having diverse writing talent and diverse directors and casts and so forth, but people are actually going to make measurable steps toward fulfilling those goals. So that would be my, um, that's my hope. Um, you know, the, 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 the Sesame Workshop, we do have a, a writing fellowship program that we started about four years ago, and it's specifically for uh, writers from racially underrepresented backgrounds who want to write in kids TV and we've had 32 31 fellows to date who have participated in our program and um, in the first two years of the program currently 70 something percent of those writers are now either staffed on shows for Netflix for Apple for Disney for you know Nickelodeon or they're writing freelance scripts for them and they're terrific, they're talented writers, and, and we're getting to this point where people are coming to us and saying, tell us who some of your writing fellows are. So I think that, that there's something that everyone can do if they really are, you know, if they really see that this is an important endeavor to make sure that all types of voices are represented, then people just need to commit to it and, and make it happen. Uh, Luke, what do you tell people when they're like, Ghost Rider, cool, I wanna do something like that. Like, what's your big advice? Like, how do I become you? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, well, the, um, there's sort of two, two main jobs. So there's the writing component and, and the directing component. Of the, and I'd say in TV, it's, it's, it's a little more of a writing medium, too. So I'd probably speak to that first. And just to Kay's point about um, some diverse perspectives, underserved communities uh, that need more writers coming out of there. I guess I would just speak to those folks and say, if, if, if representing your community is an important sort of part of, of your aesthetic and, and what you're trying to say, you know, every writer needs writing samples and things like that. I would say, never be afraid just to re reflect that experience right on the page in a, in a, in a writing sample that you're going to send out to people because th th that's, that's, people are looking for diverse voices. So mm -hmm. don't feel like you have to kind of mainstream your story to appeal to a, a broader audience. If you're just trying to get a job and impress like a showrunner who wants to read your script, uh, people will be much more impressed by a specificity uh, in your voice than uh, kind of a low, lowest common denominator, please all uh, voices sort of um, approach. So that, that's sort of one perspective there. Um, and obviously what Kay said about mentorship is really important. And then, you know, it's very 
difficult and a lot of these things end up relying on luck far more than they should <laughs> so mm -hmm. which means perseverance is also an important thing of just trying to hang in there uh because it's just a competitive field no matter um no matter who you are so like you just gotta try to get back up on the horse after you get kicked off numerous times uh, as far as directing, which is sort of a different discipline, I definitely am a product of film school and that's, I had a successful short that uh, brought attention to my career and I, I was able to kind of carve a career out that, that way. Uh, directing almost seems less straightforward to me about how to, how to, how to do that. <laughs> Whereas uh, there, there is a little bit of a path and kind of structure to the writing side of it, uh, which thankfully comes down to being able to write well writing a good script and that usually gets you a job uh i mean knowing people helps you get a job too so as much networking as you can possibly do that that helps as well um we're also you know celebrating the series um are there other series kids or not that maybe you think are not that you love right now but you'd like to shout out like maybe things that are like maybe not everyone's watching um you know just something you like that we should go watch um, well, okay. <laughs> I'll say I'm going to talk about some Sesame Workshop shows. So another one that we have, it's also on Apple TV Plus, and it's for preschoolers, and it's Helpsters, and it's a puppet series for pre for for two to five year olds. And the focus, the curricular focus, is coding, and um, it's a lot of fun. And I think that we're um, we've been getting a lot of great response from um, kids and families, and. Um, that's a hard question. Yeah. To, yeah. Um, I just yeah. When I'm off the clock, when I'm off the clock, yeah. I do not watch uh, children's shows. So, no, exactly. Uh, in, in, Insecure on HBO is really good. Oh, uh, Normal yeah, People yeah. on Hulu is really good. Uh -huh. uh, um, high maintenance, I like a lot. So yeah, I, I don't really watch. <laughs> I watch a lot. I, of I, I've, I've watched so much Paw Patrol during the day in this house that yeah. I, uh, I I I just need a break. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, speaking of things we love, we're about to watch the trailer from the second season, or the second half of the first season. Um, what can you tell us about what's to come, Luke? All right, so we have two amazing books uh, that will fuel more of the mystery for our foursome here. Uh, one is a beloved uh, horror novel that rhymes with Schmankenstein that I think you're going to recognize, <laughs> and then... There is also uh, a really cool uh, young adult novel called The Disappearance of Emily H, uh, written by Barry Summy, um, which has a fascinating device that allows um, our characters to look inside the memories of other people, which then uh, our kids use uh, to help solve the mystery. Uh, not that they will solve it. They'll, they'll inch closer to solving it. I will never <laughs> tell you when it will be solved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's the big, giant mystery of Ghost Rider. Like, who is right. Ghost Rider? If you guys exactly. want to just tell us now, that's totally cool. Too. No. <laughs> it, it, it's K. The K turns out to be the K. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you guys so much. Let's watch this trailer. Something creepy is going on. We all see it. Whoa. A ghost. A ghost writer? It's not easy being the new kid. The menu board says come together. Ever since you moved here, we've seen these bizarre messages. This never happened at my old school. I'm pretty sure it's never happened at any school. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Ghost writer let the characters out of the book. The Mad Hatter. Alice, the rabbit. That's Mr. W Rabbit to you. What is this? What are you doing? Oh, horrifying. Look. Mowgli from the Jungle Book. Why did Ghost Rider release these characters? Find the book and read it. That's the only way we're going to solve this mystery. Do you have anything to eat? No. Nope. So now we can hear animals talking. Where is my dinner? I have grown tired of the cheap kibble. Ghosts only hang around when they have some sort of unfinished business. Something bigger, a real secret. A small cat. What I like in size, I make up for in charm. Ghost Rider, can you hear us? Hey, 
Hey, the whole city, Ken. Super cool. You have no idea. All right, I am so excited for the second half of the season. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Uh, congratulations on all your on all the show's accolades and Kay on your new promotion there. It's so exciting. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's, I guess, say goodbye to everybody. Bye. <laughs> all right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>